Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast with Kate Riga. And, you know, last last episode, we, I think in the intro, I said how the, the, the episode was going to be all about abortion, like 10 different things about abortion, you know, the politics of abortion, the little bit about the uh, med- medicinal abortion, you know, every all these different stories, but they all uh, uh, turned on abortion. And uh, this episode's going to be a little like that. Um, we were just before we started recording, we, uh, you know, I said it's another kind of all abortion episode. And then we got into a little, a little, little mini debate, pre pod mini debate about whether the polls we're going to discuss are also about abortion. So kind of like a little interpretive question we got into. But before we get into that, um, I want to thank all of you because uh, a couple days ago, we hit our goal in our annual membership drive at TPM. And our goal was to sign up a thousand new members. And that's a lot of members. That's not like, you know, it's not 12 or, or 20 or 100. A thousand is, was a really ambitious goal. Um, just to give you some sense of scale, uh, we right in, with these new members, we are just under 32,000 paid members, subscribers. When I say paid members, we also have, and, and everybody should, uh, uh, we always want to remind people about this. If you are on a fixed income or if the price of a TPM membership just is not feasible for you, if, if you, you, you love TPM, you want to be able to access all the different articles and everything, but it's just not within your means. And that doesn't mean like, hey, Josh, I already subscribed to the Times, the Post, and the Atlantic, and 10 other places, and you know, kind of TPM is sort of not quite in, you know, no, that's not for you. Uh, but you you know what I'm talking about. If it's really if if you're not in a financial position to do it, a lot of people who get these are 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 seniors on fixed incomes. We will give you a free membership. Drop us a line. We'll give you one. Also, if you are a registered student, we will also give you a, a free membership to TPM. Uh, Full time registered, part time registered, either one. In any case, that's what the whole paid membership thing means. Back to the main story. We set a really ambitious goal, a thousand new members, and ahead of time, in uh, just under three weeks, we got to that goal. Um, now, that's really uh, a big deal for, for TPM as a going business concern, and it's just a, a big shot in the arm for us as an organization um, because you, you, you hit those uh, goals uh, even more quickly than you had uh, an- anticipated, because people believe in what you do, and they like reading what you publish, um, and so they want access to it, and they want to support it, and all that kind of stuff. So um, I know in the last in the last few episodes, we've we've spent a lot of the introduction talking about the drive. So I don't want to uh, uh, belabor the point now, but I really do want to thank, especially everybody who joined during the drive, and just all of our members, because uh, it means a huge amount to us. Um, we're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about it anymore, but the drive actually goes on till the 15th and you can still get the 40% discount, um, until the 14th. So keep that in mind if you're still interested in subscribing. So, uh, the big news in our, uh, neck of the woods, which is to say the political neck of the woods, not just the political neck of the woods, but obviously, you know, we, we often, when we say political or politics, people default to thinking like, okay, electoral politics, but obviously politics is is about our interaction with the larger society and how we govern ourselves as a society and uh, as a republic. And as you probably, a, f- a few things happen in rapid succession um, at the beginning of this week. Uh, on Monday, I think it was, maybe, maybe, yes, on Monday, Donald Trump came out with this statement, which was, you know, kind of classic Donald Trump, uh, a lot of word salad and like absurd lies and then kind of evasive talking around the points. But what he was trying to get people to believe 
which which to me is not true at all. But what he was what he wanted to put into everybody's head, no national abortion ban. That's not for me. I, you know, I I got rid of Roe, yay me. And now it's back to the states because I don't want this to get in the way of me getting reelected and staying out of prison. Okay. Um, let's just put an asterisk there that that is certainly not true that he's that he's not you know that that he wouldn't uh, sign a national abortion ban but anyway that is the intent so yesterday as you're certainly aware by this point as always we're recording this on Wednesday uh, Arizona the Arizona Supreme Court came out with a ruling that had the effect of pushing Arizona back to being under the law that was originally passed in 1864 when Arizona was a territory. Arizona didn't actually become a state, I think, until 1912. Um, So, you know, 50 years later or something like that. Uh, And what that law does, basically no abortions at all. I believe the only exception is for the life of the mother. And as as we have learned, life of the mother tends to be uh, a, a... a relatively meaningless exception since you in most cases literally have to be dying and at the point you can prove you're dying you're probably going to die so not not a big exception and uh as you may know abortion rights activists in Arizona had already said they have enough signatures to get a ballot initiative on the ballot in November. So it hasn't happened yet. They haven't actually submitted them and there's a whole official process and people try to knock out signatures and all that kind of stuff. But the organizations who run these kind of drives generally know how many signatures you need to have to make sure you have padding enough not to, you know, not to get knocked off. So it's not official yet, but we already pretty much know there's going to be a ballot initiative which would kind of take you back to what you probably call Roe Plus, because as we know, Roe was being sort of, was was already dying a death of a thousand cuts for a long time. Okay, so now abortion is right back at the center of the election in Arizona. There's a big Senate contest in Arizona, Ruben Gallego and Kerry Lake. Um, and obviously Arizona is a pretty critical state in the presidential campaign. It's not an absolutely must win, uh, state for Joe Biden. He can, he can win the presidency without it, but it's, it's tight. If you don't, if you, if you just take the blue wall states and you don't, you can, in theory, you can win it with just the blue wall states but like with like a a one electoral vote margin then you get into like Nevada and Arizona and Georgia conceivably in a you know in a stretch North Carolina maybe even Florida anyway all right super big deal and what was so revealing is Carrie Lake and remember she still kind of considers herself the rightful governor of the state uh and you know big lie not a, she's not only so big lie she has her own secondary big lie about 2022 when she lost the governorship to Katie Hobbs. She put out a statement that was hilarious to read just on its own terms, but was a really good illustration of how boxed in Republicans feel on this issue. Lake is a very hardcore opponent of abortion rights. Um, as recently as last year, she was saying this 1864 law was awesome. She wants it to be put back into effect. So, okay, that's where Carrie Lake is, a kind of down-the-line anti-abortion absolutist. She comes out and says, this is so bad what the state Supreme Court has done. I oppose this decision. I demand that Katie Hobbs the, you know, de facto governor of the state immediately solve this terrible situation that has been created. Um, Also, uh, I think, also I oppose abortion, 
Also, uh, it should be left to the states because that's what Donald Trump decided yesterday, i.e. Monday. This is a conversation happening on Tuesday. And also Arizona is a state. And she also says, and, and this will be decided in the referendum on November, the ballot initiative, which she opposes. And so when she asks for Katie Hobbs to solve the problem, presumably that means she's asking her to make sure to legalize abortion in the state with the Republican state legislature. They have no idea what to do with this. They're, they're, they are, I even saw uh, yesterday, they're kind of coming up with like a, an ad hoc independent state legislature version of the Trump doctrine about leaving it to the states. Because I saw some people saying, well, leave it to the states, but we didn't mean the state Supreme Court. We mean like legis. I mean, they don't know what to do here. So uh, that is kind of a lot of what we're going to talk about today is is tied in on that. I wanted to give you an overview. Kate, you own this meta issue, uh, the the ballot initiatives, reproductive rights, the court cases. The, tell me what I need to know. What, what, what do we make of all of this going on? Yeah. So, I mean, just to set the scene with kind of the abortion landscape in Arizona that we were working with before, um, they had a 15-week ban that was passed, you know, kind of right around Dobbs, right when any, everyone could kind of see which way the wind was blowing. But before um, Dobbs actually came right. down, right? And that ended up being kind of important, I guess. Right. That's right. And part of the kind of Republican legislative thinking, which they made clear in these kind of like special little notes they made during the special session when they were passing it was that, you know, this law does not supplant any stricter laws. And and they were thinking of this one at the time, this 1864 uh, law, you know, dating back from when Arizona was a territory that, like you said, from conception, the only exception is life of the pregnant person, and there's a mandatory prison sentence of two to five years for any providers who who break that law. Um, but the way that it had kind of come into force is that Planned Parenthood had sued to try to get this 1864 law off the books back pre Roe. And that had started moving through the system. And then boom, Roe comes down. This law is enjoined. It's kind of like zombie case, right? That's that's basically over. And then when Dobbs comes down, that injunction is dissolved. But now we're in this weird place where, you know, Katie Hobbs and the attorney general well, they're not going to defend the 1864 law, right? Like, so they're kind of like, no, you know, we're not going to do anything with this. Let's, and everyone kind of thought it was dead. And, and, and this, in this earlier case, you're talking about mm -hmm. a case that would have been from the very early seventies. That's right. That was frozen. Okay. Got it. And then we think, you know, you think it's kind of going to stay frozen because uh, Hobbs isn't going to defend it and it means the AG isn't going to defend it. So, okay, whatever. And then you have, you know, the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is one of these kind of right wing legal entities that crop up again and again in these cases behind various, uh, you know, like plaintiffs that they can kind of find to be the figureheads of their case. They crop up and they find this like anti-abortion doctor who's got some clinics in Arizona and they ask if he can intercede in the court on behalf of the quote unquote unborn children and the Arizona Supreme court lets him do this. So, okay, now it's a ball game, right? Now we have parties on both sides and what had happened in the appellate court. Can I, can I ask one question there? Interceding in that way, doesn't that at least implicitly buy into, well, I guess not fetal personhood necessarily since in theory you're talking, I mean, some abortions are, are, later but it the idea that 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 the that the um don't the aborted fetuses kind of have to be people at some totally. level to to intervene on their behalf you don't you don't intervene right. on behalf of like a rock so i mean yep. yeah okay totally so the appellate court had basically said okay look 
these two laws, the 15 week ban and the 1864 law, they can exist harmoniously. And basically the way that'll work is the 15 week ban governs abortions up until that point. And then the 1864 ban would kick in then basically just kind of adding like extra punishments at that point. Um, And they were like, all right, that's the solution. So then we get it to the Arizona Supreme Court. And there it's a 4-2 decision. Keep in mind, all seven justices on the Arizona Supreme Court are appointed by Republican governors. Um, The four who comprised the majority were all appointed by Doug Ducey, which we'll loop back to for a fun kicker on this story. But it ended up being a 4-2 decision. And you might be thinking, well, if there are seven justices, why is it a 4-2 decision? And that's because Bill Montgomery, the would-be seventh justice, was recused himself from the case just two weeks before it, it uh, went, went to oral argument because reporting revealed that he had accused Planned Parenthood of orchestrating the the greatest genocide against man of all time. So you, perhaps he's not um, just calling balls and strikes here. So... So basically, the Arizona Supreme Court is actually more anti-abortion than the the decision would suggest, is what that that means. Which which actually is notable, because if this had come out a 3-3 tie, it just redounds to what the appellate court found. So him recusing himself did kind of, I mean, clearly inched it closer to a a win for abortion rights. But 4-2, the majority says... No, these things can't exist together. 1864 kind of takes over the whole scheme. The 15-week ban was premised on the existence of an abortion right, which doesn't exist anymore. So it's not good law. It's like, it's pretty contorted thinking, honestly. And it's even a little bit hard to follow because they're doing what, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court does this sometimes, but where it's like, none of their arguments are kind of like solid enough in and of themselves. So they just try to kind of overwhelm you with like a lot of pretty weak arguments to, to try to uh, make it seem like it's a better case than it is. Um, And then the dissenters basically wanted to take up the appellate court strategy, you know, and, and keep the 15 week ban and then basically just intensify punishments for providers after 15 weeks. So, I mean, okay. So just, not knowing any of the legal doctrines or case law or whatever, it would seem to me straightforward. The most, I mean, how we normally do this is the more recent law governs that that's, that's how laws get repealed. So, but, but it sounds like you said that in the passage of the 2022 law, the, the state legislators kind of saw that and they kind of put in some put in some pointers for the courts about we don't really want to get rid of this old one kind of thing. But like, something. yes, but in session notes, which don't really count as part of the law and goes more to kind of this very squishy legislative intent type thing, which right. we pretty habitually see right wing judges kind of use when it helps their case and then totally disregard as right. you know right. unnecessary chatter when it doesn't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, well, can I ask you this, one, one more yeah. question there? When you were when when this came out, um, I mean, I knew this was happening in general, but I had I wasn't following that this part of it closely. It I was wondering, like, okay, is there some part of like the you know kind of Arizona legal jurisprudence where is there? Did anybody say anything that that made it at all plausible that? despite all these, this Supreme Court being appointed all by Republicans, that there's just something about uh, legal interpretation in Arizona that they kind of had to do this, that that the 1864 law was the way to go. And that's just, even if you don't like it, that's how the law would work in this case. I mean, I guess the best argument you can make is if the legislators didn't want 1864 to control, they would have repealed it. Right. It wouldn't be on the books anymore. I mean, it's almost it's pretty similar to the Comstock Act stuff, right, that people on the right will say, well, Congress can repeal it at any time, which obviously, you know, they can't because they wouldn't have the votes to do that. And the contrary argument is kind of like this law is ancient. It hasn't been used. You know, we have more kind of modern legislation governing the same tactic. And those are kind of the same arguments that are going on in this Arizona one. Um, So, you know, this ruling comes down and it, 
is this weird situation where you've got all these people who it politically helps, right? Or at least potentially politically helps. Like we'll get into the politics of it, but you know, the obvious top lines are Arizona's a state Biden really needs to win, or at least, you know, really strongly wants to win. You've got uh, what will soon be an open Senate seat that Democrats are going to need if they want to control the chamber, not to mention all the down ballot stuff. Um, and you've got this ballot initiative that organizers are currently working to get ready for November. And all of that creates a pretty, like, non-negotiable reality that this ruling is politically good for Democrats. And everyone kind of acknowledges that. But even, like, those people won't kind of come out and say it for the very real reason that now Arizona has the most draconian abortion ban in the country, right? I mean, the reason that it helps Democrats is because people don't like their state institutions co-signing on mass suffering like this, you know? So it, it was just this like weird kind of tension of a moment after it came down, you know, and I'm like on the phone with uh, one, the lawyers for like the plaintiff in this case, you know, and, and looking at the reaction of the organizers behind the ballot initiative and the Biden campaign and everything. And it's just this weird kind of tension of being like, this is a terrible decision. This sucks. You know, this is so out of step with what Arizonians want, blah, blah, blah. And then also then you kind of inevitably and awkwardly have to segue into the, so what do you think this means about November thing? Right. right. And it's just like, right. so those two things are obviously real, but now we have like the threat in, in Arizona isn't just theoretical, right? And we've talked before about how a 15-week ban, nobody likes bans, right? And like adding 15 weeks to the front of it doesn't make it more palatable for people. But there is the reality that, you know, vast, vast, vast majority of abortions happen before 15 weeks. Now, you know, abortion is virtually criminalized in in Arizona, all of them basically. And what the court did, which kind of I thought shot a, a hole in their entire argument, is that they maintained the punishments from the 15 week ban. So, you know, the losing your license and all the rest that kind of kick in if you uh, if you give an abortion that's like illegal under its terms, they're like, those are fine. We'll keep those. So we'll just layer those atop the mandatory prison sentence from the 1864 uh, law. So, you know, as the the lawyer for the plaintiffs told me, she's like, you know, this completely contravenes. And the, pl the plaintiffs here are the pro-abortion rights right. side. Okay, got And it. so she said, you know, this completely kind of contravenes what you learn in law school and statutory interpretation that like you give more weight to the newer, more modern law. Um, and she said instead, they just kind of like picked and chose from the two and made a more draconian abortion ban uh, by like kind of Frankensteining these two laws. And that's exactly what they did. So now you've got a huge motive for people to go vote for this initiative and you've got no other path to abortion rights, right? So it's, it's completely existential. Arizona's got a Republican-dominated legislature, kind of famously some of the most insane Republicans in the country come from this legislature. Um, you've got the the completely Republican state Supreme Court. And as we've seen, and we'll get into, but, you know, the power of Katie Hobbs here is like somewhat limited, um, you know, to the extent that other kind of Democratic governors have been able to, to hand down like different abortion protections. For her, it's mostly been constrained to vetoing um, you know, Republican abortion restrictions, basically. So, and, and we'll get in a little bit, there, there's a little extra wrinkle to that, which we'll get into. But, you know, it just means that the ballot initiative is the only way to ensure any abortion access in Arizona. And an interesting kind of layer here, because last week we talked a lot about Florida and how abortion access there is also quite contingent on their ballot initiative, but we also got into the fact that the Florida legislature has a pretty rich history of taking ballot initiatives and being like, no, thank you. We, we will not abide. But Arizona is one of two states in the whole country where legislators aren't just free to kind of ignore or rewrite ballot initiatives. And that's because 
in Arizona, if they want to make changes to a voter pass initiative, they have to put those proposed changes back on the ballot next election cycle. And actually in 2022, the legislators tried to be like, this sucks. We don't want to have to do this anymore. And they put on the ballot a proposal that would remove that measure that would give them free reign over ballot initiatives and voters knocked it down by like 70 percent. So if it passes, there's a lot less leeway here for Arizona leg- Republicans to just kind of ignore it or, or otherwise undermine it um, than there there would be in other states. So one question I have is when when this came out, I saw a number of people say, well, um, Governor Hobbs, both the governor and the attorney general, both of whom are Democrats, have done various things within their power to say, we're not like if this happens, we're not going to enforce it. So maybe the whole thing is theoretical and doesn't really apply. But what I at least remember from a lot of other states is often local DAs get in on the act. And then and local DAs are, I mean, in 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 most, certainly in most Western states are elected. Um, so that would kind of <coughs> nullify that. A, nullify that for a woman wanting to get an abortion, potentially and much more likely nullify it for doctors or institutions that might do it. So that's one, local DAs. The other point that came to mind, like, let, let's let say, maybe you'll say this isn't the case, but let's say uh, Attorney General is the only one who can really do anything, so whatever. I would be thinking if I were, you know, uh, had any legal liability connection to an abortion clinic, what if what if she's out of office in two years and then the new AG comes in and it's still within the the statute of limitations and I'm indicted? So the, so on both counts, that doesn't really seem to count for that much. What is what what have you found out on that? Yeah. I'm in a similar place. Basically, when you know Katie Hobbs won her election by running on a heavily abortion-centric platform, and then when she got into office and Chris Mays was uh, elected as the AG, Hobbs said, "I'm basically t- removing jurisdiction from the county attorneys, who are the ones who would you know prosecute abortion-related crimes, and I'm giving that all to the AG." And then the AG is like, yeah, I'm not doing any of that. I'm not prosecuting anything abortion related. Um, You don't have to worry about that while I'm in office. And she basically said the same thing yesterday, you know, put out another statement that was like, while I'm in charge, you don't have to worry about this enforcement of this law from me. And I think it's like you say, I mean, it's some, it's something of a comfort, right? This, this law is going to spring into action in what, like 10 days now. Um, And there's a little bit of a safety net. I also totally assume that she'll be dragged into court for this, but very unclear to me how you can kind of force a prosecutor to prosecute specific crimes. You know, they, they generally, I mean, we have this whole concept of prosecutorial discretion, which rests on the very fact that, you know, an AG can't possibly prosecute everything. So they have to be allowed to kind of pick and choose what they do and what they don't. Um, But I mean, like you said, that part of it is kind of nice and comforting. But like you said, she's not in this position forever. And while you might have kind of some comfort from being prosecuted, I don't think that necessarily naturally stems into, and so abortion clinics are going to kind of continue to operate as usual because, I mean, they're exposing themselves so much and it just doesn't, I guess I I don't feel 100% comfortable that there wouldn't be some other way for kind of anti-abortion forces to get at them for this, to circumvent Mays in some kind of way. Um, So now we're in this kind of murky place where it's like no one's going to be punished under this law for now. But I don't think that necessarily means that like abortions are going to continue apace. I would err on the side of clinics are going to stop providing abortions. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we've we seen over and over that the weak point here is the clinics. The, you know, uh, an individual person is is probably going to say whatever. I mean, I, you know, there's what happens in three years, but I need to terminate this pregnancy right now. But it's the clinics because of the mix of the doctors that could lose their licenses. Um, the Even though these are almost always nonprofits, it can be you know, the, 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 the business can be put out of business, you know, even though it's not technically a business, whatever. Um, the other, the, 
the other point that occurs to me though is I agree on um, prosecutorial discretion, but at least as you've described it, if I was uh, you know an anti-abortion rights lawyer, I would go for that executive order that the governor put you know that the that the governor uh, ordered to say, okay, local prosecutors don't have any say in this now. I'm going to concentrate it all um, with the attorney general. I mean, as we've seen, those things get reviewed all the time. And that would be, you know, that seems like something that a state Supreme Court could very reasonably review that, you know, local DA, county prosecutor, whatever the, the, you know, the, the, the term is there, goes to court, said I was elected to this position. Um, I have a broad mandate to prosecute crimes. This is a crime. The governor, you know, just that seems open and shut. That that's where you go. That and then prosecutors uh, get back in. I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to bump people out in Arizona. It just it it doesn't. As as you say, they're going to find a way, right? It's 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 just hard to. Uh, it is hard to get around the fact that this is now the law in Arizona. And, you know, it's like there's like an osmotic pressure of Republicans trying to attack attack abortion clinics, basically. And it's going to happen somehow. And I want to bridge us into the political piece of this, but but do it by, you know, one of our colleagues, um, John Light, who's an editor at TPM, he had, I think, a really interesting thought, which was, I wonder if the Arizona legislators will try to, if not defang, then soften this somehow, you know, pass another law, which is funny because like in some context, we'd be like, what are we talking about? You know, a a Republican controlled legislature, you know, trying to roll back a super draconian anti-abortion measure. But like, as you previewed in the intro, Republicans are terrified of this. You know, you had Doug Ducey, who, as I mentioned, appointed everyone in the majority on the court, put out a statement being like, you know, this isn't the court's job. This should be left to the will of the people. You've got like these state legislators who, you know, Mr. and Ms. uh, Sponsor of the Unborn Children Are the Future Act being like, this is an outrage, you know. Um, So, I don't think it's at all kind of crazy to think that they might pass something to try to make this a little bit less explosive. Um, But I do think that that is not likely to happen based on we got this statement from the Arizona Freedom Caucus, which modeled itself off the federal version. Um, And per a report from like late 2022 comprises of about a third of the uh, members of the Arizona House. And they were like, this was the right decision. You know, we shouldn't be cowed by our our dedication to protecting life, blah, blah, blah. So even though it seems like you've got some state lawmakers, especially anyone who's in an at all precarious seat, not being excited about this, it doesn't seem like there's enough kind of mass movement in that direction to potentially blunt uh, this ruling. I do wonder, and here you get into, you know, total you know, fantasy football, uh, uh, speculation, but it, it's not impossible to imagine a situation where, you know, let's say, okay, so a third of the Republicans are out. Um, it's not, I don't, I don't think Arizona is like Wisconsin where it's like, you know, two to one or something like that. It's, it's closer, I think. Um, actually I think one of, one of the houses is, is relatively close in any case, Say you get half the Republicans who say, "Okay, let's let's sort of, you know, kind of repass 15 weeks, but do it in a way that makes 100 percent clear. You know, we're going to officially repeal the 1864 thing and go to 15 weeks. And then they go to the Democrats and say. Look, this will obviously improve the situation. And then Democrats would be in kind of a. That would be kind of a tough position because 15 weeks is a lot better than a total ban. That's obvious. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think if that happened, they would probably have to do some kind of that's not good enough. We want it until viability type thing. So you get the you see so you kind of can at least angle yourself at being like, we're not going to help you bring another ban. And then 
when that falls through, you still get the kind of political oomph of the Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I think they would definitely say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to pass a law that, that if we remember what got Dobbs, what got Roe overturned was, was it Mississippi? Was it, was, was, yeah, Mississippi law that was 15 weeks, which was, you know, totally outrageous and, and, and whatever. Um, So, I think Democrats will definitely say we're not helping you pass an abortion ban. Like let if if this is if this is such a great idea, let's just do what the public actually supports, which is going back to the Roe status quo at least, if not if not Roe plus. But there is going to be a tension there. If 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 there are if Democrats have the ability to in a you know over over a period of i mean if we assume that the that the initiative is going to pass which i think it's a very good assumption it's going to be on the ballot and it's hard to imagine it will not pass if we assume it's going to pass do democrats feel obligated to help republicans pass you know repass the 15 week ban to basically legalize the great majority of abortions for a period of three or four months. I, 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 you know, it's, it, you know, I could, I could see it. I don't know who knows. It, it, it's hard to, hard to figure what's going to happen there. Yeah. Th- I mean, this is totally just, you know, early speculation and you listeners can, uh, you know, nail us later if we're wrong, but my like early inclination is that Arizona Republicans are not, going to get together to do this. I think I think that's right. I think that's and right. And partially just because it's not like the power and electoral potency of abortion as a weapon against Republicans is new to them. Like this isn't a novel concept. We've had lots of elections so far seeing this and we've had state Republicans in a position to try to head off some of that momentum, you know, like Ohio Republicans knew their ballot initiative was coming. And instead of trying to pass the like, I don't know, you know, we love mothers and children act or something, they did the election riggy type stuff of trying to lift the threshold and scheduling at a time where no one votes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's ingrained, right? Like that's their muscle memory. That's what they do. This kind of strategic moderation is just something that has been so bred out, particularly at these state legislatures and double particularly in states that are very gerrymandered. So they haven't had to practice any kind of moderation for a long time, right? That's like their only kind of political instinct is to outright flank their primary challenger. So it just, you know, it's just something we haven't seen for a long time. So no, I, I think I think you're exactly right. I think it is it is quite unlike it's quite unlikely for the reason you say. Not impossible, and just but it's so it's interesting to think out that hypothetical of what would you do as a Democrat in that case? Because this may be great for Joe Biden, but it it's gonna suck for several months for a lot of people in, in Arizona. There's no getting around that. To your point, and this is this is the box that Republicans are in. This is a potential disaster for Kerry Lake and Donald Trump, but for the vast majority of Republican state legislators, eh, Democrats aren't going to get like a super majority in the state legislature. That's not going to happen. Maybe a maybe a few a few Republicans, maybe a few Republicans are gonna, are going to lose. And maybe you could get a Democratic majority. I, you know, I don't know enough about the the dynamics in in Arizona, but that's really the key: is that the people who would have to get their act together, they kind of don't like it because they want Carrie Lake to win, and they certainly want Donald Trump to win. But yeah, if 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 for for most Republicans in Arizona to go into the next election, like yeah, I expanded abortion rights. Wahoo! You know, <laughs> is anybody going to run a primary against me for that? You think? You know, so you have this kind of game theory ish. You know, they're stuck, and e- and even to the point you had. I mean, this was what was so great about Lake's statement. And again, for her, like, I don't know if this is going to win Arizona for Joe Biden, 
but I'm pretty sure Carrie Lake is toast. Not 100%, but I'm confident because I think she was like semi-toasted before this happened, right? Just because how whack she is and all, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, but in, in those statements, you have all people saying, oh, terrible thing. It, even Carrie Lake saying, Katie, Katie Hobbs has to fix this. But they're still not willing to say, Katie, ha- Katie Hobbs needs to work with my Republican friends to pass a big abortion rights law. To they can't say this because how could they possibly say this? They're huge, you know, uh, anti anti abortion rights people. So they're just sort of stuck, and it's just a it's a delight watching their stuckness because it couldn't watching, happen to nicer people. Watching Carrie Lake do this like moderation pivot to the center has been just truly really enjoyable because you just like can't make your brand you know, I'm the, I'm the bad shit lady, right? That's like gonna file a new lawsuit in Arizona court every week. And she has this like ongoing enmity with the Maricopa County recorder. And, you know, she vacuumed the rug before Trump arrived. Like you just can't make that your thing for all these years. And then be like, no, 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 no. I love bipartisanship. I love moderation. I love listening to the will of the people. You know, it's like if MTG came out of a Republican lunch and was like talking like Dick Durbin, you just, you you can't make like the sole thing you're known for and then just like totally renounce it and expect everyone to be like, that's on the up and up, right? Like a, a line in her statement was about if she got elected to the Senate, she would not vote for a federal abortion ban. It's like, Come on, who in the world believes that? You know, if if she was in that situation, she'd come out with some, you know, some bullshit about like I've been listening to the people of Arizona and they changed my whatever. Like it's well, what, just what they usually come out with. You know, I said that, but then Ruben Gallego insulted my <laughs> dog, and that changed everything. And I saw, you know, the, but you know, some some random thing that you know they have this way of of. A, a forced changes everything event that is necessary mm-hmm. to get out of under the thing. And they also had these, she also, it just for, for listeners in her statement, she had her kind of, you know, peroration of kind of declarations and all this. And then she had a little kind of bullet points of kind of things I'll oppose and things I'll be for. And under things I'll be for, the first one literally was baby bonuses, which I, I think we know this is, this is kind of, part of the standard Republican, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna pour so much money on your baby, you're gonna be have you're gonna, you're gonna want to be pregnant nonstop, basically. But even but I hadn't, it, I don't know, baby bonuses, actually, just and it was all stuff like that. It was, you know, baby bonuses, uh, a bunch of other things that were gonna make it awesome to have the baby you didn't want to have, after all. Which is also funny because putting aside all of the kind of repercussions around forcing people to to give birth, it's also just Republicans it's like have been a signing saying this, bonus, right? For a and forced Republicans birth, yeah. have been saying this for a million years. This thing of like we'll soften our abortion policy by like doing compassionate motherhood stuff, and they never ever do it because they are just like character logically incapable of giving money to poor people so it's like that's never going to happen um yeah but it's also you know the Carrie Lake thing is hilarious it's so funny that you could tell that when Trump put out his like really garbled leave it to the states thing on Monday you know that he thought you know, wipe my hands off. I'm done. I took care of that problem. That is not going to be an issue anymore. Like what a masterful political stroke there. And then you could tell throughout the day after he put out the statement, he was getting really pissed because he was like truth social raging, you know, at Lindsey Graham, who expressed like the mildest disagreement with his statement at, um, you know, the Susan B. Anthony list people for, for, being mad, even though they ended their statement with, by the way, we're going to spend every day working to, you know, make sure Biden and congressional Democrats lose. You know, he, 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 it's his usual thing of like not being able to brook any criticism whatsoever. But also I do think it stemmed from this place where he thought 
that was the death knell to abortion being an issue for him in this election. Um, and of course, he really cares about that because this is his first election since Dobbs, right? Like this is the first time he has to deal with the ramifications. Um, and now it's like, I thought leave it to the states was this great, moderate, reasonable sounding proposition. Like no one can possibly be mad at him for that. And then two days later, Arizona just kind of like dumps all over that plan and is like, yeah, we're going to arrest doctors for giving any abortions in Arizona now. And he's just like, God damn it. You know, is it isn't this the the the, the, you know, many states had or have various permutations of snapback laws and and what is it like trigger laws Mich- yeah tri- well, t- okay yeah snap there's snapback and then the trigger laws but what uh michigan was michigan's from like the 1930s the michigan law so a lot of them are pretty old but i think mm-hmm. that even in that context this is one of the or the most draconian i mean how can it be more draconian i mean it's like right. no abortions at all basically so i don't but but um as you say it's it's kind of uh it's a very, it's a very heavy handed pl- plot line, right? <laughs> to go like full Handmaid's Tale in, 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 in what is possibly the most critical state right. in the, in the, in, in the country. And I, I say that because for listeners, because, um, if, if he, if Biden wins Arizona, he's pretty clearly going to win the blue wall states. And so if he wins Arizona, Trump is really on his back heels. Like he could win, but it's pretty tough. And vice versa of all those kind of emerging democratic South, you know, Southern tier Southwestern states, that's probably the most likely. I'm not, I'm not really getting into Nevada here, which is kind of its own thing and whatever it's, but in any case, Arizona is pretty critical. And for it to be right there, that's like just like um, getting a sucker punch, like just right to your face, right? Just catching you totally off guard. And you can kind of tell by the way that Biden at all reacted, right? And and this was something we talked about on the pod last time, but the way that they kind of sprung into action after the Florida ruling is, I mean, it stands out. They don't always react to things like this. And with a lot of it, they get a good deal of criticism for that, especially in the realm of like Trump saying something horrible or getting in some big legal trouble that then Democrats are just kind of, you know, they do this this very Democratic Senate brain thing where they're just like, oh, we're going to be above the fray, right? Which like drives kind of Democratic political operatives crazy. But with Florida, all cylinders immediately doing rapid response it got into, you know, all the speeches from the kind of main surrogates. Like it was the subject of the next few days. And you saw the exact same thing here. Like as soon as the ruling came down, you know, there was a Kamala Harris statement. There was a Biden statement. Um, you know, Kareen kind of opened the the White House press briefing with it and took a whole bunch of questions on it. Um, they the campaign sent out these like reporter notes, the roundups of all the headlines. You know, they started calling it Trump's Arizona ban. It was just kind of immediate blanket coverage, knowing, I think, that this is the kind of harmful to Trump headline that does fully permeate all of the kind of media structures, even those that are generally so resistant to kind of like good news for Democrats, bad news for Republicans kind of stories. So they clearly kind of see this as a potential linchpin to the electoral effort in the state. And they're just going whole hog to try to be like, there's a horrible ban. You all hate it. It's Trump's fault. And don't forget about that. One question, one question I had on this, did I, I know that we knew that the state Supreme Court was reviewing this, but did we have a relative sense that it was that this was an early April decision or is it one of these things where it could have happened kind of any time and it just dropped yesterday and that and that was like a total shock? Well, no, we had um, the warning of the court put out a little alert thing saying that like we're going to deliver our opinion on this ruling at 
10 a.m. on Monday. This was like late last week. Okay. So everybody right. so had some like prep time. Okay. To so, kind of... so everybody knew it was okay. So it yep. was totally new. The, so the only thing was that that it was going to be this as opposed to the 15 weeks thing. And I saw a number of of, of uh, articles that interviewed, you know, Republican campaign people and saying what makes perfect sense. The kind of like 15, we, we can handle that. Like that's that's doable for us. Like if it's the 1864 law, we're kind of fucked. Right. Which, you know, makes perfect sense. On the, on, the, on the Biden thing, I don't know how much this is I don't know how much to see this as a distinct thing, but one thing, as 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 some listeners may know, I spend way too much time on Twitter. Um, but what I've noticed is they have this Biden rapid response account on Twitter, and it's really good. I mean, to the point where, um, you know, we all have influencers slash activist groups slash reporters that are just on an issue that you follow just because you want to hear as soon as things happen. And that that Biden rapid response thing has kind of become one of those for me. It's very um it's not it it it's not operating kind of you know campaign brain, you know, kind of very couched and everything. And it's even even visually kind of signals that, that their, uh, you know, their avatar is a, you know, dark Brandon, you know, kind of uh, matrix eyes, Joe Biden and everything. Um, but to your point about being very aggressive and very fast, that account is kind of all over every crazy thing Trump says. Um, and, you know, that's, I think that's largely just the, you know, the Twitter permutation of you know their their campaign and their rapid response and everything, but it, but that does um, that does stand out to me. And another thing that they uh, did, and you know this is how you do campaigns. You don't get lost in kind of like well well. A lot of the media will try to get you lost in this, saying well this is. This is Arizona, but Trump said this and he's not going to do a ban and blah, 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 blah. Every time one of these things comes out, whether it's in Florida, which, you know, again, we have sort of something parallel where they the 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 court simultaneously signed off on a pretty draconian ban and, you know, green lighted the um, green lighted the the legislative, uh, the, um, uh, you know, ballot initiative. Every time one of these things comes out now, the Biden campaign releases some kind of video quick hit, and the text under it is, Trump did this. Trump did this. And exactly. That is exactly, you don't get you don't get lost in kind of like, well, this, and there was an 1864 law, and there was a lawsuit in Arizona, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and what they back it up with, which again is exactly right, because it's true, Trump is out there saying his proudest moment ever was destroying Roe. He did it. You know, what is it? The Taylor Swift song. It's me. I'm the problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm, I'm generationally out of step. I can't I can't recite all the lyrics, but I'm 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 down with the youngs enough that I can that I can that I can make the reference. He says he did it. He did do it. All of this is down you know, is, is the, uh, is downstream of that. And that is just exactly right. You don't get lost in the, in the weeds. Trump did this. He did do it. And that's, that's how you have to hit it. Totally. And I do, I love, you know, this kind of jumps off from what you're saying, the idea that they're not, you know, the thing that was so irritating about the coverage of Trump's statement was all of the mainstream headlines were, Trump wants to leave it to the states. But even if you kind of take what is the best possible space <coughs> for Trump, leaving it to the states is co-signing these really draconian bans that the states choose to pass. You know, that's saying however much you want to restrict abortion is like fine with me. So it's, you know, it's both the crowing over Roe and his current stance. His current stance is supporting the Arizona ban. Like that's what he says from his own mouth, you know? So I, I totally agree with you. And 
they just put out this ad. I don't know. Did you see it? That it was um, about this couple from Texas and the woman was carrying a non-viable pregnancy. I mean, the ad was gutting. Like the the couple was still clearly just in the midst of it and had gone to the emergency room, you know, multiple times and the doctors kept turning her away and she got really sick and you know, the kind of ultimate conclusion is she might not be able to have any more children because of the damage done while they kind of forced her to just get sicker and sicker. Um, you know, and it had all this details about, you know, the little footprints and the blanket and all, you know, it was, it's horrible. It's like completely gut wrenching. And they turned that into an ad that, as you say, kind of ends with the Trump did this, like this is the ramification of his actions. And it's, I just think it's smart. It's politically astute. And also it's just true. Like if you're going to unleash this kind of suffering, then you should have to see it in all of the kind of gory granular details of what that looks like in people's lives. Yeah, no, I, 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 I did see it. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of, um, in the 2012 campaign, part of the mythology of that campaign, and, and when I say mythology, I don't mean in the sense that it's not true, just the kind of the received memory of how that campaign went, that uh, the Biden camp, I'm sorry, the Obama campaign went up pretty early, earlier than now in the cycle, maybe, I don't know if it was in the fall or when, whenever, maybe a little earlier than now. With a series of ads about uh, some factories that were shut down by Mitt Rom- by Bain under Mitt Romney, right? He's uh, private equity. That's kind of one of the things you do. You, d- you buy companies, you downsize them. What does downsizing mean? You shut down factories. And I, I believe that one of those ads, I, I think I'm right here. One of the ads was actually uh, talking to one of the people, one of the guys who lost his job. And it was basically, he describes how uh, I, th- I think they brought in the workers from whatever other country they were going to send the factory to. And so he and his colleagues trained those guys oh my God. On, on how to do their jobs before they lost their jobs. So it was one of these things of kind of just, you know, it's it's a very different kind of gut wrenching, but still kind of like just a a a political message and a fact of things that happened and um you know captures the things that everything hates about how our economy runs and and in that case it was literally who did this Mitt Romney did this and again how the mythology of the 2012 campaign uh comes down to us is that those ads really solidified this idea of Mitt Romney is a super rich guy who makes money doing things that show he couldn't give a crap about how it affects sort of ordinary people who live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, And, you know, today we live in this different reality in which kind of we're, you know, kind of, okay, give Mitt a pass on that since he doesn't want a coup. And like, okay, I mean, I'm I'm down with that because a coup is pretty is a pretty big deal, right? But that was true, and it kind of just, uh, you know, whether it won the campaign for for Obama in advance, who knows? But it 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 took a, it sort of imprinted on a lot of people's minds that Mitt Romney is that guy, and if that is imprinted in your head. When it comes down to the last couple of months and everything's chaotic and crazy and, you know, sort of charges going back and forth and everything, when when you have to decide, you're going to kind of remember he is that guy, right? And I, I think it's clear that the Biden campaign is trying to do that now with Donald Trump on the issue of abortion. And it is, you know, abortion... Uh, abortion hits a different demographic both literally and um and and in in a political sense 
But I do think that kind of, you know, Donald Trump did this. And he's so, uh, he's not able to say he didn't do it because he's proud of it. I don't think he really gives a crap about abortion one way or another. But he's very proud, kind of like everybody said they would do it. Reagan said he would, you know, all these Republican presidents, only I could do it. And like, give him credit. He did do it. You know, as the Biden campaign saying, Trump did this. And it's really important just from a basic education level. Like, I know I've told this anecdote before because it so fried my brain. But that one, like, voter interview in the New York Times or something where, you know, the woman says that abortion is her number one issue and also thought that Biden was anti-abortion because Dobbs came down during his presidency. <laughs> which is just, you know, you sometimes just get reminded how little people pay attention and it just kind of shocks you to your core. Um, so, you know, there, there's a piece of that as well, <laughs> like training people to kind of know what went on here. What was the machinery of Dobbs and, and who authored that court? Well, it's also, and this is, you know, implicit and it kind of goes without saying, but, you know, after those those very ingenuous reactions to Trump's Monday statement where Again, they were trying to suggest, and a lot of media reports accepted the suggestion, like, okay, Trump's pulled the plug on abortion for this election. You know, he's not against it anymore. He's he's wiping his hands of it. He's, you know, it's kind of whatever. What they're doing here is very clever in kind of saying, wiped his hands of what? He, he already did it. He literally already did it. So, and again, that that is both obvious, but I think when you say it, you kind of, you know, kind of, uh, you reset everybody on the reality. He already did it. So kind of like he can deny he did it, but he already did it. So it's kind of like, it doesn't matter what he says right now. He did it. And now he's going to face the electoral consequences and the backlash. Of right. course, that makes perfect sense. So speaking of electoral consequences, we yes. wanted to end with this polling shift we've seen of late um, in Biden's direction. And, you know, usual caveat, caveat, things are still noisy, right? Like it's only really been in the past few days that I think a lot of the kind of polling people tm have said this is a sustained enough shift to kind of say pretty decisively that that this has been a shift in in biden's direction it's not just kind of a few uh good polls for him in the mix type thing um so you know what have you thought about that josh like where are we in kind of I guess where we are post state of the union where, which is where it feels like this started to, to change direction a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as, as you said, we've been seeing signs of it, um, for a while, but these days there's like a million pollsters and, and a varying degrees of, of, of credibility. So it is, and, and we're also in a very partisan era. So there's not going to be like 20 point swings, right? You're only going to get sort of bobbling around 50-50 uh, um, results. So we've been seeing signs and the signs, just more and more signs. Uh, and and to the point where people who were, um, you know, either skeptical or wanted to see more, like you've seen enough. Clearly there is a shift. Um and so I, I guess my take on this is th there's a few different ways to see this. One is, and this is an important way to see this, it's still very early. It's still a good six months before the election. And that means that these results, um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't put that much in them. And that's as true now when they're better for Biden that, as it was three weeks ago when they were less good for Biden. So that is a, that is true. Um, B though, I think again, even from a skeptical vantage point, it shows that these numbers are still very fluid. Um, and this goes back to, you know, when Ezra Klein, what, six weeks ago or whenever that was, was saying that, you know, we actually needed to basically depose the incumbent president 
and do a Thunderdome uh, convention where we would pick some governor who's never run a national race before. And that wasn't totally insane. That was totally insane. And they premised it on this idea that it's the Democrats' campaign to, to lose. Everything's going great for Democrats. But you have this historically unpopular, terrible, you know, maybe not terrible president, but terrible candidates. So you got to get rid of them. And that was that was always just stupid. And 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 um, uh, stupid because you have these early polls that don't mean very much. And and so so you know one of my one of my few ways to look at this is not to say, "Wow, Ezra, you were a big fucking idiot, and now you should admit how dumb you were." Although we can do that too. It's probably it's 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 probably merited. But it's to remind it's fluid. So don't be thinking kind of like, oh, uh, Biden's terrible or, oh, we're kind of, it's a disaster in the making. They're fluid. It's every, things are, it, things are uh, uh, fluid and malleable, which means you got to run a good campaign and everybody needs to kind of, you know, um, get their shoulder into the, you know, into the back of the car and, and push it forward and all, all that kind of stuff. The, the two big things to me are, are almost, I would say, the big thing is, you know, besides the fact that it's less depressing to get up in the morning when you see like, you know, polls that are good for Biden than the reverse. But my theory of the case, and it's just the theory of the case that I buy into, not that I, you know, came up with, is that these are, were early polls and that in a general election environment, which really kicked off with the combination of the State of the Union and the uh, de facto end of the primary process where officially it was clear who the nominees were going to be, that once you got into that general election contest, you were going to see movement in Biden's direction. And we are now basically five weeks into that general election context, four weeks maybe, I can't remember the exact amount, and you're seeing movement towards Biden. And so that's good, not just because it's movement towards Biden, that just in the way that if you have a theory, it's good to see early evidence confirming your theory if you want your theory to be true. Right. So it, it, it's it's not just that there's some some, you know, some some decent poll numbers. It's that they are tending to support uh, slash confirm the what what people were saying was this crazy optimistic theory of the case. And it's it was a good theory of the case. Now, the other side of that is that it is true that Biden probably needs to win by a few percentage points to win the Electoral College. I want to put in a little asterisk there because we don't 100% know that. Um, as you have states like Arizona and Georgia getting into the mix and um, other states like uh, Iowa moving out of the mix, that kind of that kind of built-in sense that Democrats need to win sort of at least three, by three points to win the Electoral College, that may not be true again. It's definitely my assumption that it is true, and we definitely should assume it's true. But a lot of that actually depends a fair amount on which states are the ones in, in, in play. But in any case, so the point is, he needs to get more ahead. Right. So that that's that's uh, that's that's an important thing. And uh, all sorts of crazy stuff is going to happen. But, you know, it, it should. I think the one the one thing that people should definitely take from this is that I that idea that a lot of people had like, OK, we're going to lose. And 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 the sort of the it's, it's kind of locked in because we have the wrong candidate or there's just something foul in the water or something like that. That, 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 that's not true. Joe Biden can win this. I think I'm not saying I'm confident or whatever. I think he is going to win, but this is, it's, it's just, I think important for people to look at this Democrats who were, you know, really demoralized to look at this and say, Hey, Joe Biden can win this. And not just some theoretical sense. Like we've got some momentum behind us. And it, it's funny because there's a, a guy who, the new guy who runs um, 538 um, after Nate Silver, very smart guy. Um, and I was sort of going back and forth with him on Twitter about this. And he was sort of leaning into the, yes, there's movement in Biden's direction, but it's 
still early and, you know, the still early logic applies now just as much when it's good for Biden as, you know, a month ago when it was good for Trump. That's not 100 percent true, because, again, now we're in a general election context, so it's not identical, but it's still mostly the case. But the point I made to him, and I think he he conceded, is that a huge amount of what is now baked into the commentary is there because for four or five months, we had Joe Biden two, three, even four points behind. And so you actually do need a corrective here. And and so, yes, everybody should be... Um, Everybody should be realistic and know that these are still early numbers. They're numbers that show a lot of fluidity, so it can bounce back. I'm sure it will bounce back and forth to some level. Uh, but again, we need a cor- – so there's two correctives. One corrective is that the the ingenuous people who built a whole campaign commentary narrative around those old polls actually need to revise some of that narrative. Because it was based on things that have now been shown not to be true. But the other thing is the Democrats need to kind of, you know, I give you permission to soak in these good numbers, not to fool yourself, but because it is neither realistic nor productive to be in a, you know, an electoral major depression, right? These are good numbers. So, so. Uh, Biden can win this, and everybody's got to kind of see that he can win this. And when you see that he can win this, that's just a lot of um, that's a lot of incentive to get out there and do all the things that you can do individually to make that happen. And as like kind of an addendum to this, in terms of the general election landscape, that applies both from the narrative media comms perspective, which we've talked about a little bit with this, you know, this rapid response. That's the bucket of ad dollars going up on TV, uh, you know, all the kind of campaign narrative shaping that the Biden campaign wasn't doing too much until State of the Union, kind of like that was the starting gun. But then the other piece of this is campaign infrastructure, which we've seen a lot of kind of interesting reporting around. And this goes hand in hand with the Biden campaign's like massive fundraising advantage. Um, And that's led them to staff up massively in all over, you know, not definitely in all the swingy places you'd expect. But, you know, I I saw that they're putting an office in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is like big red Trump territory. So they're clearly kind of confident enough that they can at least maybe lessen the margin of loss in areas like that. Um, Meanwhile, all we've heard is this like, you know, the Trump campaign is great this time. And and a lot of that is predicated on the fact that they've got, you know, these two kind of like serious, real Republican operatives at the helm and not the kind of band of like college Republican presidents that were doing it in 2016. But that being said, they've not got a lot of money. You know, I know that Trump just had this big fundraiser where they came out crowing that he had you know, (laughs) neatly doubled the amount that Biden raised at their big president fundraiser. But even that has all these question marks around it. And a lot of people think he's they're probably talking about PAC money and not just kind of direct contributions, which we don't have to get into. But that's just that's a a horse of a different color. Um, But, you know, there's this NBC article that came out this week that said he's got like five staffers in each of the biggest battlegrounds right now that they are not going to have money to advertise significantly until the summer um that they're going to they're going to win with quote old school methods like paid door knockers you know so it's the kind of thing that we've heard all these fear baity stories about how Trump is more muscular more disciplined more streamlined this time that just doesn't really seem to be the case and he's also dealing with the fact that a ton of money that he brings in is has to go to his his legal stuff. So, you know, this is tangential from the polls, but we sometimes, I think, live in this world where the 2016 scar tissue is so 
gnarled that we all think like, well, we don't know anything about politics anymore. Like every old chestnut has been turned upside down. You can't rely on any of the old markers because, you know, Trump has upended politics and and we just can't know anything anymore. And like he's lost every election since 2016. You know, he managed to lose his party, the White House and both houses of Congress pretty quickly. Um, You just you can put limitations on the Teflon Don narrative. And like at this play at this point, I'd still rather be Biden than Trump, you know, modest poll gains, notwithstanding. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, we also said um, that uh, I think it was in, 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 in last week's pod that there's this, you've got the, uh, you, you have all these things happening. You know, there's the money deficit that Republicans have. Uh, you have, Trump's takeover of the RNC, which means a that a lot of RNC money will probably end up going to his legal bills, and they also fired a lot of um, a lot of the RNC staff. And you know, uh, the party, as as we've said, the party committees aren't what they used to be, but they still play some pretty important roles. And there was actually, it's interesting that um, one thing I saw a couple of days ago is that. They seem to have realized pretty quickly when they took over the RNC that they they came in very heavy handed. They did these like employee review things where you go in and they ask you if if the 2020 election was stolen, all these kind of things. And they basically a lot of people just quit and then they try to get them back, but they won't come back. So even they seem to kind of realize, you know, you you. Again, there's the and you also have the fact that like lots of Republican members of the House are just bailing, right? There's a lot of kind of stuff that looks like kind of institutional breakdown happening on the Republican side. And to uh, to Kate's point, we all have this sense of but nothing matters anymore, and that will be good for Trump and being convicted and sent to prison will be good for Trump and all, all this kind of nonsensical stuff. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, campaigns are about voters. You're not going to have the fact that there's like, you know, kind of a 50, 50, you know, Republican coalition. And suddenly they just never don't show up because of the RNC, but those things matter. And I, you know, it's possible those things are going to come into play to some non-trivial extent but going back to the point before it's it's this is winnable for biden and and you know campaigns are hard you got to get in there and and everybody you know we can all uh vote unless you're from one of these states where you have a felony conviction and you're not allowed to vote um but you know in 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 principle we can all vote and there's things we can do individually and donate and volunteer and all that kind of stuff and so there's at least as I said before, you you have my permission to kind of soak in these positive polls, just to kind of reassure yourself that that your candidate is in the game. Yeah, and, we, and we've said this before, but despair is what Trump wants. Yeah, right? like totally. authoritarians kind of come to power on the strength of citizen of cynicism and you know being disheartened and feeling like. There's no lesser of two evils. Everything is bad. Everything's corrupt. And nothing matters. So, nothing I exactly. do matters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know. All right. We've given up. you a shot in the arm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that is that is it for um, that is it for this week's episode. I want to remind you again, thank you so much um, for participating in our drive. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, not only is it great for uh, TPM as a company, but uh, the whole team, we all felt great you know, just kind of putting up that number and knowing that, that every one of us was, was a critical part of that. So thank you for that. And, uh, we will talk to you next week. See ya later. The Josh Marshall podcast is hosted by me, TPM reporter, Kate Riga and TPM founder, editor in chief, Josh Marshall. The show is produced by Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to Why Not Jan Spell for our podcast theme song. And thanks to all our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen.